So the Holy Spirit, he is not just here to make you feel chills, thrills, and spills. Tell your neighbor, the Holy Spirit empowers you to persevere. The gospel is not only words, but Paul says that the gospel is power. Christ, that question is settled. You are a son of God. And last week we spoke a little bit about this theme that we uh, want to talk about in the pastoral table. Pastor Nino, the pastoral staff called The Promise. Say with me The Promise. If you're wondering and you were not here at the beginning of this series, The Promise is the person of the Holy Spirit. The person of the Holy Spirit. Jesus told his disciples, wait in Jerusalem, wait. That's a thing that's hard to do. We're an instant generation. We want everything quick, fast, and in a hurry. In those three sequences, quick, fast, and in a hurry. Right, so we go through a servicarro, we go through the drive through we go through the microwave. And Jesus says, that in the African-American church, they call it tarrying. You tarry. In English, it's wait. Say with me, wait. Because some things are worth waiting for. And so he says, wait in Jerusalem until the promise has come. And he's talking about the person and the manifestation and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I want to, this morning, share with you, go with me to Acts 19. I want to talk to you about the maturity of the Spirit. Say with me, maturity. If you will allow me to unpack, if you allow me to unpack something, what I want to help us together navigate is superficial understandings of the Holy Spirit often limit what you can see about the person of the Holy Spirit. I'll say that again. Superficial understandings or immature understandings of the Holy Spirit will often limit us from experience what Paul called in Greek pleromatus or fullness of the Spirit. And so we live in a generation where often there are superficial understandings of the person of the Holy Spirit. Or worse yet, there is ignorance about the person of the Holy Spirit. And some people have said, ignorance is bliss. Ignorance is not bliss. Ignorance is dangerous. Ignorance is very dangerous. People have done great damage when they're ignorant about things. Right? For example, if you don't know that you're supposed to put on the turn signal when you're turning left, and you're ignorant about that, and you turn left without pulling out the turning signal, a thing which is very popular here in the great state of Florida... Anybody know what I'm talking about? It can do damage to you and to other people. And so during this series, we're not just going to inspire you and impart to you. We're also going to educate you about the dimensions of the Holy Spirit. The dimensions of the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. We began last week with going through the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. From Genesis to Malachi, all and all in between, the Holy Spirit had a function. The Holy Spirit was working. And he was doing something in the life of Israel, in the life of individuals, in the life of kings, in the life of prophets. He comes into the New Testament and you see the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the life of Jesus. Say with me, in the life of Jesus you see the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Ask me where, ask me where, where, where. It's in a particular place, in a particular place. The Bible says over there in Luke chapter 4 and Matthew 4, both Matthew and Luke have this narrative. It says that the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness. The next, the next part of that pericope bothers me. Anybody ever read a text that bothers them? You're like, what does this mean? That it troubles your soul. Anybody ever read something in the Bible? You're like, what is going on here? The next part of the verse says, the Holy Spirit leads Jesus into the wilderness, comma, to be tempted of the devil. What? What do you mean the Holy Spirit leads Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil? Matthew has it a different version. Matthew says that Jesus is driven into the Spirit. And there's another phrase. He says he comes into the wilderness full of the Holy Spirit. You all know what happened in the wilderness, right? He fasted 40 days and 40 nights. At the end, because the devil is a coward, he doesn't, he doesn't attack Jesus when Jesus is full with food. He comes at the end. Devil's a coward, I said. Right. 
He attacks Jesus at the end when he's hungry. And you remember what he says to him, right? If you are the son of God, questioning his deity and questioning his kingship, but also questioning his obedience. Make these stones turn into bread. If you are the son of God, throw yourself from the pinnacle of the temple. If you are the son of God, you remember these? these if you are the son of God, the three temptations of Jesus. He resisted. This is a powerful phrase. At the end of that pericope or at that passage, the narrators, the evangelist says, he left the wilderness full of the Holy Spirit. What? He comes in full. He fasts for 40 days. The devil attacks him. One, one other translation says he, he wrestled with the devil. And then he leaves full because if you're full with the Holy Spirit, a wrestling with the devil will not empty you. A temptation will not empty you. Because the Holy Spirit is not like gasoline. I'll come over here. The Holy Spirit is not like gasoline where you pour it and you empty it out. Or he's not like oil where you pour it in the motor, you burn it out. The Holy Spirit is a person. And Jesus is full of the Holy Spirit. And no matter what he goes through in the wilderness, he leaves just as full. Because it is not just that he's infilled. It's that he has a permanent relationship with the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you this. Tell your neighbor, temp temptations should not empty you from the presence of the Holy Spirit. Now tell them again, you go in full, you come out full. And so we have to teach people that when life squeezes them, it doesn't produce less oil. It produces more oil. And so we have this ignorance of the person of the Holy Spirit. I imagine by now you found Acts 19. Over there in Acts 10, 38, it tells you how the Holy Spirit ministered into the life of Jesus. I'm giving you the text, Acts 10, 38, for you to remember. I'm not going to read it now, but I'm just going to put it into your spirit so you can reflect on it later. Acts 10, 38 says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And he went around doing two things, doing good and healing all those that were oppressed of the devil. Because when you're full of the Holy Spirit, you do two things. You do good and you deliver all those who are oppressed of the devil. Acts 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and with power. And he went around doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. Because the Holy Spirit is not just for you to feel good. It's to do good. The Holy Spirit is not a feeling. It's a person who empowers you with the power of God to do good and release the oppressed. You're with me in Acts 19? It's a fascinating thing. Read with me. Because faith cometh by hearing and hearing of the word of God. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, what did he ask them? Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. It is possible to come to church and not even have heard of the Holy Spirit. But we're going to remedy that in the 21st century. We have not even heard. Were they saved? Yes. How do we know they're saved? Because it says they were disciples. They were already disciples. He asked them, have you heard? Have you received? They said, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, let me tell you about dimensions. John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him. That is in Jesus on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul, come on, placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit descended on them. And they spoke in glossolalia, in tongues. And they prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. Usually the disciples walk in groups of 12. Paul entered the synagogue, say, say with me, and he spoke boldly. He, how did he speak? How did he speak? I'm going to talk to you about ingredients and manifestations of the Spirit. How did he speak? He spoke boldly there for three months, arguing how 
He argued persuasively. Say with me persuasively. Say boldly and persuasively. He argued persuasively about the Basilea Totheu, the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned. This is before they were called Christians. They were called the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years. How long did he hang? How long? Because the Holy Spirit gives you endurance. You don't start something and quit something when you're empowered by the Holy Spirit. It gives you longevity. It gives you endurance. The Holy Spirit is a person that gives you power to endure. Power to persevere. We need a generation full of the Holy Spirit that has the power to persevere. I'll preach here. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Turkey or Asia heard the word. How many people heard the word? All Jews and Greeks heard the word. Read verse 11. God did extraordinary miracles. You know what I fascinated about the narrator? He could have just said miracles. God did miracles. That's enough. He didn't. He says God did extraordinary miracles through Paul. So that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick. And their illnesses were cured. And the evil spirits left them. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to mimic the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon possessed. They would say in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. The seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest were doing this. One day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know and Paul I've heard about, but exactly who are you? The reason they could not identify the power in the sons of Sceva is because Paul had the same Holy Spirit that worked in the ministry of Jesus. While the sons of Sceva had an imitation, a forgery, a counterfeit. Who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped all over them and he overpowered them all. One man overpowered seven. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. Be when this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear. And the name of the Lord was held in high honor. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. Because the Holy Spirit brings confession. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their sorcery books and manuals together. Do you hear what I'm saying? The power of the Holy Spirit is so powerful. That every sorcerer who had a sorcery manual brought it to the center of Khan. And they burned them publicly. And when they had calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to about 50,000 drachmas. It's about a silver coin or a day's wages. It's $50,000. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. I want to submit to you that Ephesus teaches us something about the Holy Spirit. Say, teaches us something about the Holy Spirit. Let me talk to you about Ephesus. Ephesus is an interesting town. Ephesus is an interesting town. It's a city. It's a port. It is by the Asian Sea. Now, let me be clear. If you went to Ephesus today, you would not see it as a port city because of climate change. Some of the land has come up and some of the water has receded. But in the times of Jesus and Paul, it was a port city. It was by the ocean. Now it is a little bit inland. Ephesus was known because of its dedication to a goddess. The Ar goddess was Artemis. You remember Artemis? Artemis in Greek philosophy was the huntress, but she was mixed together with the goddess, with the Roman goddess, because that's what they did back in those days. They, they syncretized religion. A little bit of this, a little bit of that. It's like religion in many of Latin American countries and in, ha in Haiti and in many uh, other countries where you take a little bit of Catholicism, a little bit of voodoo, a little bit of sorcery, and you mix it together. That's called syncretism. Artemis in the 
town of Ephesus, she was the goddess of hunting, but she was also the goddess of virility, the goddess of productivity. She was also considered a virgin goddess. She was trying to mimic other virgin goddesses of Egypt. They had what we call a religious cocktail. In Ephesus was the temple of Artemis. In, the, in Ephesus was the temple of Artemis. But don't just think of it as a temple. It was also the center of economic and political power. In other words, if you wanted to be mayor, you had to give homage to Artemis. If you wanted to be a successful businessman or a successful businesswoman, you better have sold the books of Artemis. What is one of the greatest transactions in the city of Ephesus? Ask me, what was one of the greatest transactions in the city of Ephesus? One of the greatest businesses was transacting in manuals of sorcery, magic books. Magic books is one of the greatest businesses. They were called manuals of sorcery. And it was very profitable because they came from all over Asia Minor, all over Turkey, to visit the Temple of Artemis. It is so, so important. I mean, it's, if you went now, you would only see one of the pillars there. Everything else is pretty much leveled. But some of the remains of the Temple of Artemis are in the Temple of Hagia Sophia in Turkey and other places. It, it, was, it was a wonder to see. It was one of the great temples. And some people have said one of the great ancient wonders. And Paul comes into Ephesus and he says... I'm going to take her on. Who's the big goddess here? Oh, Artemis, I'm going to take her on. I have a question for you. If you were in Ephesus, would you have done that? Would you have gone into Ephesus and say, who's the big deity there? I'm going to knock her down. The only reason Paul is able to do this is because he understood that he was part of a movement. And touch your neighbor and say you're part of a movement. Touch the other neighbor and say you're part of a movement. That was supported, that was endorsed, and that was empowered by the Holy Spirit. And so when you know that you, what you're coming with is greater than what's already there, you're not afraid. When you know that what you're coming with is greater than what's already there, you're not afraid. And he says, he says to the guys in Ephesus, he says, have you heard of the Holy Spirit? They say, we've never heard of him. In his mind, Paul, Paul is an apostle. Paul's a strategist. Paul's the kind of guy that goes into a fight and he says, where's the bully? I'm going to punch him in the nose. Paul was assertive. He was aggressive. How do you know he's aggressive? Somebody say, how do I know he's aggressive? That's his track record. He was a persecutor of the church. Anybody he disagreed with, he had to do one or two things. He either tried to persuade him or tried to kill him. Thank God the Holy Spirit grabbed hold of Paul. Somebody say, thank God the Holy Spirit grabbed hold of Paul. Because he could have ended the church. It's a vicious dude. And he comes into Ephesus and he says, who runs this town? Who's the boss? What's the name of the principality and the power of this town? Who is the king of this town? Everybody says Artemis. That's why he's upset at the church of Ephesus. Because he says, have you heard of the Holy Spirit? And they're like, no. And he says, that's why we haven't had any growth here. He, 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 he says, they're disciples there. The first, what's the first question he asked them? Have you heard? And they say, Paul is dumbfounded. Paul is exasperated. Paul is troubled. You know why Paul is troubled, exasperated, and dumbfounded? He's exasperated, dumbfounded, and troubled because he knows that he's part of a movement that is there to do what Pinky and the Brain do every single day. Uh, if you don't watch TV, you don't know what I'm talking about, but I'll tell you. There were these two lab rats in, in, what was the name of that dude? Tiny Toons or whatever the tunes they were. And one of them was called the brain. He was a smart lab rat through accident. He had an overdeveloped brain. And the other one was called Pinky, who was the exact opposite. Had no brains. And Pinky would ask Brain every day, Brain, what are we going to do today? Say with me, what are we going to do today? Say, what are we going to do today? Brain would say, the same thing we do every day. Plan to take over the world. These two little rats, they're in a cage. 
And they're planning to take over the world. When Paul goes into Ephesus, he says, man, Apollos is great. He's great at apologetics. Paul, Apollos was a great teacher. Thank God he too ran into the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says that when he came into Corinth, Aquila and Priscilla taught him about the mystery of the Holy Spirit. Oh, I wish somebody was here. Tell your neighbor, thank God. Ephesus learned about the Holy Spirit. Thank God that at IEC, we're learning. Touch three neighbors and say power to change cities. Power to take over the world. This is no, this is no f flailing movement. This is no movement that crouches in a corner as in intimidated by the giants of its day. This is not a movement that cowers before Artemis, the great goddess of hunting. This movement does not hide. This movement, the Bible says that if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you do two things. You speak boldly and persuasively. So the Holy Spirit, he is not just here to make you feel chills, thrills, and spills. The Holy Spirit here is to empower you to know the mind of Christ. Oh. The Holy Spirit reveals the mind of Christ. For who shall know the deep things of man if not the spirit that is in man? And who shall know the deep things of God if not the spirit? Tell your neighbor the Holy Spirit empowers the church to speak boldly and persuasively. Some of us speak boldly, but not persuasively. And some of us speak persuasively, but not boldly. Hey, I want you to notice in the book of Acts, every time one of the apostles or disciples is filled with the Holy Spirit, what happens to the crowd in the reaction? The Bible says, and when Stephen filled with the Holy Spirit, mm, shit. The Bible says they're stoning him. I, I'm not, I didn't mean that. I don't have uh, can I talk to you? What were they doing? Why were they stoning him? The Bible says that while Stephen spoke, by the way, the introduction to Stephen says he was a deacon filled with the Holy Spirit. While he was speaking, the hearts of those who heard him were convicted, one translation says. Another says they were persuaded, so much so that they had two options, either be converted or kill the voice that's speaking to them. Every time. What happens when Peter is filled with the Holy Spirit? You remember Peter the last time you saw him? Who remembers what Peter was doing the last time you saw him? Before Pentecost. He was hiding. What was he doing? Hiding. Somebody tell me what he was doing. Hiding. hiding, not just hiding, denying Jesus. Pentecost comes, the Bible says, and Peter stood up. Because the Holy Spirit makes you stand up instead of cower. I don't even have time. We need a church that understands that when we go to Ephesus, it's not to ask permission. It's to change the city. Acts 17.6 says, these who turn the world upside down have come to this city. And so the Holy Spirit is God empowering people to change the world. He spoke boldly and persuasively. The Holy Spirit empowers you with the mind of Christ. So you know the gospel. You know what you're talking about. Number two, it gives you endurance. Say with me endurance. Say with me endurance. Look at me and I want you to hear me. I tell my sons this every week. You're a man filled with the Holy Spirit and God is empowering you with resilience. The city, Orlando needs people filled with resilience. I'll come over here. We need people filled with what is resilience, the power to persevere. Because when you're knocking down giants, they don't go down in a day. Does anybody know Spanish? All right, I just want to translate, make sure nobody's, nothing is lost in translation. I'm speaking in tongues. Principalities, powers, Legions, false religion. 
You don't go into a city, plant something, and leave the next day. I'm not even going to preach today. I'm just going to walk over here and be nice. Tell your neighbor resilience. Tell them again resilience. Why was the early church so prosperous? Because they were resilient. They go into a town, and to, until the town was changed, they wouldn't go. Touch your neighbor and say resilience. Dile ahora, dile ahora, esto no es para gente poquitita. Dile, esto no es para gente poquitita. Tú quieres cambiar tu ciudad, te tienes que quedar ahí. O se cae el gigante, o no se cae. Either the giant comes down or he doesn't come down. Tell your neighbor, the Holy Spirit empowers you to persevere. Hey, you're praying for your family. You don't see your son getting saved. You stay there. That's called tarrying. You just tarry until the promise comes. Some things you got to pray through. The Bible says that God heard Daniel on what day that he prayed? What day did Daniel pray that God hear him? The first day. But it took 10 days to get the answer. What day did he hear him? What day? Come on, read that. Read that Bible. Say with me, read that Bible. That's going to be my theme this year. Say, say with me, read that Bible. Daniel chapter 9 and 10 tells us that the first day that Daniel prayed, God heard him. What day? Why did it take so long? One day, two days, three days. When the angel comes, by his name, his name is Gabriel. When Gabriel comes, he says, hey, I'm Gabriel. I am the one who stands before the presence of God. I have a message for you. On the first day that you prayed, God heard you. And he sent me to bring you this mission of the last days. However, when I was coming down, there was the prince of Persia. The prince of Persia tried to impede me. Because you're wrestling with principalities. I said Artemis is in the city. But the Holy Spirit is coming. And a Santa Claus that's coming to town. It is the church filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Tell your neighbor, Orlando, watch out. Avito, watch out. Utuado, watch out. Coming to a city near you, a church filled. The prince of Persia impeded me. I love this about God, that God has a squadron. And so he sent Michael, his archangel. Ah, I don't have time. Michael means who is like God. In other words, when the guy tries to impede, Michael shows up and says, who are you? Because my name is Michael. Who is like God? The weapons of our warfare, Corinthians, 10th chapter, 4th verse. They are not carnal. If they're not carnal, what are they? If they're not carnal, what are they? Some Work with me. If they're not carnal, what are they? If they're not carnal, what are they? The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds. Destroying what? Every imagination, every thought, because the Holy Spirit reveals the mind of Christ. And when the mind of Christ comes into a city, every other mind seems dim. Say with me, perseverance. The Holy Spirit, if we limit the person of the Holy Spirit to chills, thrills, and spills, you miss the greater dimensions of his manifestation. Paul says, the multiform manifestation of the gift of God. La multiforme manifestación del don de Dios. That means it has many forms. One spirit, but many manifestations. And so what we've done is we've castrated the potential of the church because we have not taught about the dimensions of the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit is bringing you deeper and wider so you can understand how great how wide and how deep is this manifestation of the love of God in the person of the Holy Spirit? They come into Ephesus. Artemis is there. Paul, for two years. How many years? Pastor, I, I, love, I love the Holy Spirit. I love the church. I love the presence. Pero si llueve el domingo, no llego. 
Tell your neighbor, perseverance. Tell them again, perseverance. I want to tell you right now, there are people sitting right here that are going to experience a new dimension of the manifestation of the Holy Spirit during this season. And they're going to see themselves in a new way. Before, they would fold under any pressure. But you're entering into the season of boldness. You're entering into the season of taking risk. You're entering into the season of telling Artemis, we're coming in and your temple's going down. There's a difference between confidence and arrogance. Can I talk to you? Can I talk to you? Somebody said, Pastor, talk to me. I'm going to talk to you. Sometimes we t teach people humility in the wrong way. And, and so what happens is, instead of teaching them humility, we teach them passivity. Talk to me. What's the difference between humility and passivity? Ask me, ask me. What's the difference between humility and passivity? I'll tell you the difference right now. Humility is giving honor to where honors do. That if you do something, you know it's because God empowered you to do it. You didn't do it. You don't shine with your own light. Nobody Somebody did that. It wasn't me. That's humility. You give honor where honor is due. Passivity is where you let everybody run all over you. I assure you that the early church was not passive. Because if it were, you wouldn't be here today. Paul wasn't like, I wonder what the Roman Empire is going to do. Oh, my. Oh, my. Oh, me, my. Oh. Polycarp wasn't like, hell, oh, they're going to burn me at the stake. Polycarp. Mm. Can I talk to you about Polly? Somebody say, talk to me about Polycarp. Full with the Holy Spirit. They put him in a Colosseum and they turn him on fire. Before they set him on fire, they say, renounce Jesus. Polycarp is about 90 years of age when this happens. They say, renounce Jesus. Somebody say, they were going to set him on fire. Polycarp says, my entire life he has done good to me. I will not renounce him now. They burned that boy like a marshmallow at a campground with the Royal Rangers. I ask you, I ask you this morning, what gave Polycarp the boldness to sustain that? I ask you this morning, what gave Polycarp the boldness to stand there and be burned alive at the stake? If it is not the power of the Holy Spirit, I know not what it is. And so the Holy Spirit, he empowers you with boldness to live life. He empowers you with wisdom to speak persuasively. Huh? He empowers you with perseverance so you can endure the journey of God's mission in your life. So was the move of the Holy Spirit that people tried to imitate it. Counterfeit Holy Spirit. Can I talk to you? That's going around in the world. People who are charismatic but not anointed. People who know how to manipulate your emotions. By raising the tone, ah, that's nice, but that ain't the Holy Spirit. That is a manifestation of a classical cultural feeling of the Holy Spirit. I don't have time. Please explain to me what this means. I'm so glad you asked me. Look, somebody once asked me, explain it to me like if you were explaining it to a child. Because the best way for someone to understand it is if a child can understand it. Explain to me the responses to the Holy Spirit as if I were a child. I said, oh, easy. Any of you ever get burned by an iron? Anybody? Because you had the bright idea of testing if it was on before it was. <laughs> right? Anybody ever do that? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I've seen two people get burned by an iron, two. And I've seen two different reactions. Anybody in that group? Tell the truth. Or is anybody in that group? Some of y'all lying in the house of God this morning. Anybody in the I I I group? Others, other, I saw this other guy get burned, and he's like. Yeah. 
And he runs to the, and he goes, right? Goes, puts it under water. I submit to you that they both got burned by the same iron. But they had different reactions. The Holy Spirit, when he touches you, you could be an I.I.I. person. <laughs> but some of you could be the... What you don't judge is the reaction. We don't have time to explain the phenomenology. The Holy Spirit is so powerful that when the New Testament writers write about him, they always write about him in allegory and phenomenology. They say he's like a wind. Because if I make him a wind, I make him too weak. He's like a wind. He's like a dove. He's like a fire. Because the phenomenology is so transcendent, you have to use similes and metaphors to explain his power. Amen. So some of you are going to be like, and some of you are going to be like, es el mismo espíritu con diferentes reacciones. Don't, don't judge the reaction, judge the authenticity. When the Holy Spirit comes into the city of Ephesus, he gives them boldness, persuasivity, perseverance. Then, you know what he does? He destroys counterfeit religion. Amen. The true Holy Spirit destroys idols. Look at me. You know the Holy Spirit is working in you if he's destroying the idols of your life. Pastor, but I don't have any muñequitos in my house. I don't have idols. No. Money's your idol. He wants to burn it in the center of the city. Pride is your idol. He wants to burn it in the center of the city. Fame is your idol. He wants to burn it in the center of the city. The size of your church is your idol. He wants to burn it in the center of the city. Because God will have no other gods. He's all God, all by himself. And the Holy Spirit points to the centrality of God. Tell your neighbor, the Holy Spirit burns all idols. How many of you want the Holy Spirit to burn idols this year? How many of you have idols? Things you, little ones. They might be little, but you need to destroy. Things. What is an idol? What is an idol? Anything you put before God. Anything you put before God. You know when John, the, oh, I got to preach today. I got, like, I got like a revelation word today. I, like, I feel like Rhema running right through this thing. John tells the church in what church? What church is it? Somebody tell me what church he says, I have against you one thing, that you have lost your first love. Somebody look it up. It's in the book of Revelation. I'm here. We're here to do a Bible study. You came to church and you opened the Bible. Read that Bible. He says, I have against you that you have done what? You have lost what? What? Pensive. Come here, pensive. Come here, pensive. He's Rafael El Pensive is his nickname. Stay right here. Stay right here. Stop right there. When I used to teach this in Sunday school, they used to say, you lost your first love is when you first got converted. Remember that? Who remembers that? Cuando primero te convertiste, que si el pastor dice, brinca por un fuego, tú deciste cuánto fue. Right? But that's not your first love. That's your puppy love. Unmature, unsophisticated, erratic, unrational. When John speaks about first love, he's not talking about time. Not when you got, he's not talking about time. Say to your neighbor, he's not talking about time. Tell him he's not talking about time. He's talking about place. 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 Somebody say, Pastor, explain that to me. Place means that every one of you has loves. You don't have one love. You have multiple loves. If you're a human being, you have multiple loves. I'm going to come over here. How many of you have multiple loves? I do. I love my wife. I love my kids. I love Calvario. I love the church. Huh? I love music. How many of you have multiple loves? It is possible to, because you're a complex human being, you can have multiple loves. Yes? Yes or no? I love basketball. Love it. The, I think the Lord has to burn that in the center of the city. 
over here. John says, I have one thing against you. Pastor Tito, come. Somebody say, we're learning about the Holy Spirit. Stand right behind El pencil. Jamil, come. Where are you? All the handsome men of the church. It goes in order of handsomeness. June, June, I just want you to tell people, Holy Spirit uses black people. I just want to put it out there. <laughs> Interesting pants. All right. <laughs> John says, you have many loves, church. This is your first love, your second love, your third love, and your fourth love. He says, well, you know what I have against you? This was Jesus. You've lost him. And you put him in the back of the line. I have against you that you've lost your first love. And now your second love is your first love. Money. Power. Your denomination. The title of your church. And anything that is in front of your first love is idolatry. Idol. 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 Vogue magazine. Your self-esteem. How you color your hair. Whether you're skinny. Or not. And the world sells you. She's Artemis. She sells you other things, other temples. The world sells you other temples. Vogue magazine tells you that your value is based on how you look. The devil is a liar. Your value is based on that God loves you. Punto y se acabó. So Paul comes in and he says, wait a minute. Have you not heard of the Holy Spirit? No wonder this city is anemic. Receive the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes into the city, he comes down knocking down idols. What is the first sin? Tell, tell, somebody say, what is the first sin? The first sin is you shall have no other gods before me. That's idolatry. Anytime you put something before God, it's idolatry. John tells the church, your sin is that you're an idol worshiper. You've put other things before me. You have lost your first love. When the Holy Spirit comes, he says, oh, no, we're going to have this. We are not going to have this. If you jump up and down and speak tongues, but God is not a priority in your life, I doubt that you've known the Holy Spirit. Si hablas lenguas humanas y angelicales, pero Cristo no es primero, yo dudo que has conocido al Espíritu Santo. Because the Holy Spirit exalts Christ. And whenever Christ is exalted, Artemis goes down. The power of the Holy Spirit is to destroy idols in city. So much was the destruction of the idols that the economy started to change. I don't even have time. I'll sit down because they don't. They, Pastor, you give me three more minutes, Pastor. Give me three more minutes. God wants to change your economy, your oikomune, your budget, how you use your money. Because if Artemis goes down, you burn the books. The guy said, this is real revival because it cost us 50,000 drachmas. You know that revival has come when people change where they give. The gospel is not only words, but Paul says that the gospel is power. That once you come to Christ, that question is settled. You are a son of God.